So this topic is basically project management. And um, a quick thing about it, I'll just say before we get going, is that project management is itself a three-month course. And in fact, uh, if you uh, wanted to pursue certification in it, it's much longer with full with tests and all that kind of stuff. Um, it's called, uh, I think, uh, PMP, I think, project management. I'm trying to think what the other proficiency maybe. Anyway, there's a lot to this and um and i don't mind this chapter i kind of view it as a primer it's a primer basically to to project uh project management but it's definitely uh something you need to be aware of as uh, as you go into anything even a, even a minorly complex project is going to require project management so uh what we're going to do is we're going to look at project planning we're going to talk about something called a project triangle uh, you can't really do project management without breaking down the work. And so we're going to talk about breakdown structures and in there, the uh, something called the critical path. We'll talk a thing, uh, about this idea of estimating tasks, uh, completion times and stuff, which is very, very tough to do. And then we'll describe sort of some sort of scheduling, um, like some of sort of the, uh, what do they call it? Scheduling tools and, uh, and in there, in the, in the various charts, Gantz and, and PERT, but also in there, we're going to be looking at uh, things like task dependencies. You know, some things can't start until other things have finished. Um, and anyway, and then, then you can read the rest of this. So, and of course, you know, there is this whole slide dedicated to why projects sometimes fail. It's actually the case that many projects don't actually make it on time or on budget, but Anyway, that's nice and optimistic. All right, so project management, though it's the scope of this topic is basically the planning, scheduling, monitoring, and controlling, and reporting on information systems development. And right there, a successful project is something that's completed on time, in budget, actually does what was required, and satisfies users. Now you think, well, if it does what it's required, didn't that satisfy the users? Well, at this stage here, if the users and the requirements, if, if, if the requirements never were going to satisfy the users, then, then um, your requirements gathering methodology was a little off. So, and, it, and it, you know, messes up the project. So this is the project triangle, and it's kind of the things that affect a successful project. Um, I kind of liken it to this idea. If you want a project done on time and does everything it, everything you're expecting it to do, it's probably gonna cost a lot. If you have no time and you want the project to do everything it's supposed to do, uh, then it's, it's uh, oh, then it's gonna cost a lot. You know, I just messed that up. I'm not, usually I'm used to the idea of cost being on, a, on, on the, uh, the uh, top here and time and scope. But anyway, they're all interrelated. That's all you gotta really get out of that idea. So what what does a PM do? They, uh, and by the way, just so you know, if you're not technical, many PMs are also not technical. So it's an interesting uh, career path for those of you um, that maybe, maybe uh, you don't wanna pursue a sort of a technical background. So they plan it, they schedule it, they monitor and report it, All right? That's kind of what's, uh, what's going on there. And, um, and the key here, I wanna point out with the reporting, it has to be regular because if the project starts to slip, you don't want to be the person that delivers, the fact it won't be delivered on time on the day that it is due. The further out you are when you realize it's gonna slip, the, uh, the better off you are. So you need regular progress reports uh, for that. So a work breakdown structure, I kind of alluded to this a while ago in the chapter I was talking about with my daughter and her uh, her bedroom. If you remember the scenario, uh, I said, please clean your room, and she kind of freaked out because it was so complicated. So we had to break down the project, the things like getting her clothes off the floor, or putting the books back in the bookshelf, making her bed. Those are sort of tasks. And so... What you basically do is you take a big task, like the project, and break it into smaller tasks. And then um, these tasks can then be basically put onto something called a Gantt chart. And so this is actually almost a, a good view of a Gantt chart. You'd have your tasks, your, your WBS is right here, your work breakdown structure. 
you actually have each bar indicating the, well, first of all, each task is broken down. And then you have the bar representing the duration of the task and roughly when you figure it's gonna start and when, when it's gonna end. And then this part in here indicates what has actually been completed. So hopefully you're in line with your developers and you know what has been completed. And then roughly where are you now? And so a quick gasp on this one, just so you know, is that this chart is not uh, indicating good news. There's a little bit of good news because we're apparently ahead on task four but we haven't even started this task, which is supposed to have been finished by now. We were supposed to have been finished this by now, and we were supposed to have at least some of this done by now. So this is actually a bad news uh, Gantt chart. Now, along with Gantt charts, we actually have the Program Evaluation Review Technique, or PERT charts. Um, I will honestly tell you that I don't see them too much in the industry myself. We do use Gantt charts for those projects that require Gantt charts, but, um, uh, it's an interesting idea, so why not? So we have this per chart, and then we also have this idea of a critical path, and I'll be, sh I'll be showing you that really in quite a few slides up. The key is, is that we basically, even with Gantt charts, is we use a bottom-up technique. We basically look at the project, break it down to its little components, and then try to figure out which component can go before the other, which can run in parallel, and, and, and that gets to the sort of scheduling, and then we make sure check into what's going on uh, with, the actual, uh, with the actual work. So uh, here's sort of a, an example, and this is a better Gantt chart in that um, we're seeing with these arrows, these idea of dependencies. And the PERT chart definitely shows dependencies. Um, I don't know if this is, actually it is. <clears throat> this PERT chart is an exact uh, representation of the same information as the Gantt chart. In the per chart, you also got sort of some information in there as, as well, you know, which you don't really, like each of these boxes would have this, this content in it, whereas here you just get, get the bar. All right, so uh, first thing, your task or activity. So any work that's got a beginning or an end is basically a task or activity, all right? And uh, that, um, yeah, so, this is where maintenance of something doesn't really fall into, into place uh, as a general task. It'd be the maintenance of a particular thing. And maybe, uh, uh, you know, fix this button so that it does this. That would be an example of a sort of a, of a task. But, you know, uh, again, picking up the clothes. That, in theory, has got a beginning. It's got an end. The beginning is, at this point, all the clothes on the floor. The end is that the clothes are now probably in a laundry bin. Putting the books on the shelves, the beginning is that the books are on the floor. At the end, the books are on the shelves. It's got a beginning or an end. Cleaning up my daughter's room didn't really require money, but it definitely required uh, people and time. And it's small enough to be understood. So cleaning a room, that's not small. Picking up books, pretty small and pretty manageable. And then projects also have milestones. And it's basically an event that uh, some kind of event that can serve as a reference point. So in the case of my daughter's room, when all the clothes are off the floor and in a bin, that would have been a milestone. If the bookstore, a bookstore, book uh, shelf was uh, all packed up, that would be a milestone. So here's sort of a slightly more um, corporate view here. So in the beginning of the project, we start on the questionnaire. The task itself is preparing the questionnaire and then the milestone is that it's been approved. Not every uh, task, by the way, starts and ends with a milestone, but this, this one, they've kind of beaten that idea to, to death. All right, so um, we look at this uh, idea, identifying the tasks uh, in the work breakdown structure. So we list the tasks, we estimate their duration. Uh, I know it says it can be hours, days, or weeks. A lot of times what happens, in all honesty, it ends up being days. Um, I, most projects I've seen, the least amount of time they've dedicated to anything is half a day. So, uh, so any, uh, anyway, I, I'm, I'm kind of twitching a little bit on hours, but anyway, usually it's days or collection days or weeks. How long does something take? In all honesty, sometimes what we do is we look at what, how long did something like that take before? But, uh, uh, but you know, that's not even all that great. So the deal is you take the best case, 
you take um, a uh, worst case and then a probable case is sort of in the middle, or maybe not. She doesn't even have to be in the middle, but there is. I think the book will go, will take you through a quick little formula of something like uh, B plus maybe four IP plus W divided over five, right? So that's one, two, three, four, five, and that would be sort of your estimate. But you know, um, I've never done it that way. But whatever, it's it's okay. It's 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 an okay estimate. When you get serious on this, you're going to want to at some point start like reading books on project management or checking out. Uh, it's called PMBOK, P M B O K, and they've got all sorts of resources there as well. So here they've got a work breakdown structure, kind of like what we saw in the um, in that milestone example. So we got all the tasks. We've got uh, well, they're numbered. We've got um, um, the tasks and then the duration, and, and then we haven't done this yet. We actually haven't done the duration or the, or the criticism yet. So notice here they've kind of got sort of a use case, then they kind of break it down, and then they uh, put it into some kind of order. So now we've got to think about duration. So how, uh, what affects duration? Well, once you have the tasks, uh, uh, Obviously, the more pro uh, tasks that are in a project, the longer the duration. And also, uh, how many people do you have? And a great line that you can use on someone, which will irritate upper management like crazy, but go ahead. It takes one woman nine months to make a baby. It does not take nine women one month to make a baby. The, the lesson in there is that you can put 10 people on a project, but if, if you can't run a lot of stuff in parallel, you're probably just wasting resources and not shortening the scope or the time uh, of the project. So, uh, so be aware that, 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 yeah, putting more people on a project doesn't necessarily speed it up. And I can't remember, it's in the book, but there's a name for uh, the effect here where if you put uh, uh, people on a project, it can actually delay the project. Like if you're actually already in the project and you start to add people to it because it's running slower, you're actually going to end up slowing down. So just be aware of the human resource angle with our project management. Um, if you have got similar projects in the past, then that might actually help speed things up. Or maybe you can even capitalize on some of the stuff that actually happened there. And also I would say that... Uh, um, if, if you haven't constrained it or, well, anyway, constraints will affect, uh, the project. So, uh, uh, the duration, sorry, and the project. So in this case, notice that, uh, reserving a meeting room apparently took a day. Now it didn't really take a day for that one person, but it could have taken a day when you think about the email exchanges that have had to happen. Somebody had to basically book their room. Um, again, email notifications came out, so it, it could have taken a day. So now um, the other thing that they've done that's really cool though, is they've added the concept of what can happen in parallel. And so in theory, one person could have been um, ordering these market materials and another person could have been briefing the managers. Or uh, I'm just seeing that from when I look at this. These things can run in parallel. The only thing that determines whether they can run in parallel is if they are dependent on each other. So. Uh, you can't brief the managers and then send out, according to this, you can't brief the managers and at the same time send out customer emails. Managers have to know first and then you send out the customer e emails. So sending out the emails is a successor task to uh, briefing the managers. Briefing the managers is a uh, predecessor task for uh, sending out uh, emails. All right. I think it's not a bad idea to at least your design to design your project like that first, even if you know there's only going to be one person working on it, because you want to sort of communicate what can be run in parallel. Um, because to some, to some, um, at a certain level, you may not even have your team established yet. So it's good to know what is uh, the the work breakdown structure for the project. Then, in theory. I say in theory, you could then decide, well, who's going to work on the project? And then you might find that you can't run these in parallel. And that will basically start to push, uh, push the project uh, around. 
All right, so we talked a little bit here about task patterns, and by task patterns, all I really mean is that there's like a couple of, or three sequences really. You get one task done, and then you get the other task done. So that's a straight sequence one to another. There's also a case where a, another pattern, if you want, is where you get one task, which has two successor tasks. It splits, these two get to be run, I said in parallel, but apparently the actual term is concurrent run concurrently, right? And then the other is that you get two concurrent tasks and they have one successor task. So those are the various patterns and they kind of describe them a little bit more here. Obviously, most projects are a lot more complicated uh, than that. All right, now, why is some of that important? we actually are, are now getting into something that is very important. That's the concept of a critical path. And I'm gonna be showing this to you in a PERT chart, but you can also see this in a Gantt chart a bit later too. So the critical path is a series of tasks, which if delayed will affect the overall uh, completion date. So basically uh, anything in that path, if it gets delayed, it'll your end date will move. So let's have a look quickly at a PERT chart here. So in this case, we've got five tasks. We've got to obtain authorization, hire somebody, plan and arrange logistics, and then announce the training. Awesome. Now, uh, and you can see the patterns here, right? One to one, one to a couple, and then a couple here to one, right? So they kind of got all the, all the in here. Which task, if it was delayed, would impact the uh, end date. Well, if this became 12, that pushes every, the, the duration. If the duration became 12, that pushes everything back by two days. Okay. If this gets pushed to like 40, that pushes all these guys back by 10 days. If this gets pushed to 30, it pushes everything back to 10 days or uh, sorry, five days. And obviously, this is at the end. So this gets becomes 100 then the project's delayed. The only guy that's not really that pressing is this project training. Sure, they said five days, but we can go actually as far as 25 days and not actually have an impact on the project. And so what you're seeing here is the critical path for this is uh, obtain author authorization, hire analysts, arrange logistics, and announce the training. That's the critical path. And that's where the project manager's eyes are going to be, right? They're not going to ignore this, but, uh, but there's a little bit of flexibility here for that. So that's what a critical path is. That's pretty important. When a task is being delayed, a lot of times the question will be, is that on the critical path? And so that's, that's a critical path. All right, the project manager is trying to basically monitor and sort of control the project. And... Um, and so a lot of times what we'll do is, you know, they're talking about a structured walkthrough or review everybody's work. We look, uh, uh, we're, we're, we don't just do this at the beginning. We keep doing this throughout the entire system development life cycle. And, um, and then we're trying to basically maintain a schedule because, and this is quite true, most projects run into some problems or delays. Um, so what we have to do as project managers is monitor and control the work by trying to anticipate the problems, ideally avoiding them or at least minimizing their impact. All right, and remember what I said before about you can't just identify a problem and say there's a problem, you need to be able to have an idea as to how to maybe mitigate that problem. Lots of meetings, lots of reports. Uh, I. I'm not actually a project manager in this current role, but I was one and I now work with a project manager. Um, and this guy is on the phone all the time. And uh, yeah, however, he's really good because he, because he's not technical actually. So he just completely focuses on duration, work breakdown structure. I mean, he's just diving right at the pieces and saying, are you gonna be done? Is it on the critical path? All kind of stuff. So anyway, so you got, uh, uh, a project manager will have lots of meetings, ideally, and, and will communicate to the stakeholders uh, stuff as it's going on, as it's going on. So everyone knows what's going on. All right, so we're gonna give you a sort of quick little PERT example. So, uh, so again, get the tasks, figure out the start and the finish time. So get the durations 
And, uh, and then after that, uh, you work out what are your successor tasks, predecessor tasks, and you go left to right, basically slapping them down until you, uh, and, and from there you can basically work out the finish time. So there's sort of an example of a slightly more complicated uh, PERT chart. And again, if you think about critical path, if you think about critical path, um, probably the sum here and the sum here would kind of determine the critical path. And I, in all honesty, this guy right there, the 70 days, that is just jumping out on me as being pretty well on the critical path because that's uh, nothing. I think even down here, does this even equal 70? So even these tasks down here don't even equal 70. So this is completely the critical path and thankfully the, uh, the slides agree. What kind of software do we use for this? Believe it or not, despite what the slides say, a lot of people end up using uh, goofy things like Excel, actually. But um, in, our, uh, in our world, we actually do use, uh, we don't use Microsoft Project. We used to use something called Primavera, which uh, became an Oracle product. It doesn't really matter. Here's the deal. Microsoft Project, I think you can get that. Um, Actually, I don't know if you can get that or not. I, I, I don't know what the college has got for uh, uh, Microsoft. But anyway, that's one possibility. But there are also free ones. There's Gantt and Gantter. Um, and a Smartsheet is free in the beginning. And then I think they may actually start asking you for money. And I've never even used this uh, at Pivo. And who knows? There could be other ones out there as well. And so this is sort of an example. And I think, actually, I don't know what product this is. This is now actually complete. So note the red tasks. They are red because that is the critical path. And you can see even graphically that if any one of these things uh, changes durations, the length of the project would change. Uh, these blue ones, they could change, but as long as they don't exceed uh, what's on the critical path, they're not on, on the critical path. Um, I'll say this, that if this task here ended up becoming longer, then what would happen is that would become on the critical path and this guy would fall off the critical path. So that's a Gantt chart look at it. This is a, uh, a project management, um, sorry, a PERT chart look at it. All right, and then I don't even know what that is. That's, oh, I, I see it's sort of um, a, a zoomed in look at it. All right, good deal. I don't want to shatter this, but there are probably bad things that are going to happen throughout your project. And you could be passive and just hope that everything will go great. And then, you know, have the surprised look when everything fell apart. Or what you can try to do is mitigate the risk or manage the risk. And so that's what this sort of, this part's uh, about here is talking about, um, a way for you to give you some language to talk about risk to, um, especially to the stakeholders. I'll get asked that uh, a few times myself, you know, what is the risk? And so, so this is kind of a nice um, primer to it. All right. Sort of try to plan or at least make sure everyone's aware of the risks. And then what happens uh, uh, if that thing actually happens, if the, if the bad thing actually happens. In a minute, we'll have better language. All right, so a couple things. First of all, there are actually two types of risk or risks. There are two types of risks. One type of risk is what is the likelihood? Uh, actually, sorry, let's start with quant uh, quantitative, qualitative, qual quantitative. Let's do this one. No, quantitative. Yeah. What's the likelihood it'll actually occur? Right, what's the likelihood it's actually going to occur? And then this one is, if it occurs, what is the actual impact? So qualitative is, what's, what, uh, what's, um, if, how likely is that risk going to be? And quantitative is, what actually happens if that risk shows up? And so from there, you can start developing a risk response plan. So let's just have a look at this chart for a second here. I thought, when I first saw this as an idea, I, I was blown away, because it's pretty cool. Uh, even though it's 2020, I actually have to admit, I did start playing Skyrim again. And I don't know why, because I played it actually, I got it when it was brand new, and I've played it for many, 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 many hours. But somehow I just, 
I felt Skyrim calling, so I went back and started playing Skyrim. Skyrim is definitely a buggy game. There is definitely stuff that happens in Skyrim that you kind of go, hmm. The thing is, the, the, uh, for those of you that don't know what Skyrim is, it doesn't really matter. It's just a video game. There is um, a lot of stuff that the developers and the coders had to sort of try and program around because they're basically simulating an entire uh you know universe almost or at least a at least a, a a world so so every now and again though just incredibly goofy things would happen like you know you'd hit something and then uh the thing the, the we would say the physics were off like this person would end up flying clear across the map and land somewhere else or another instance um which happened to a friend of mine <coughs> Uh, this is a dragon game, and so what would happen is that the dragon would end up flying away from you backwards, and thus you'd never be able to complete the game. For those of you that know the this, this story, there's one particular dragon that you do need to defeat, and if you don't defeat him, then you're kind of screwed. So I'm bringing all this up because it would be incredibly expensive for someone to test and make sure that the game was perfect. So what we need to do is we need to say, well, what's the probability? of someone hitting a horse and having it fly right across uh, the map. What's the probability? If it's not very probable, maybe it's not that big of a deal, unless it's got a high impact, like the dragon flying backwards. I've never seen the dragon flying backwards. I, I've never heard anyone else actually have that problem. So it actually had a low risk, a low, uh, low risk, but uh, it had a very high impact. Uh, and by the way, you guys, as we're all, um, Microsoft uh, beta testers on our operating systems. We see this happening all the time, uh, right, with, with, with our stuff. I would suspect that if your software was driving um, the trajectory of missiles, which a friend of mine actually did for a while, you care, even if it's a low impact, a low probability, having a missile basically go off course and, and, and blow up a ship, that's a pretty big deal, or a pacemaker, or something like that. So, um, so anyway, I would think that this risk here, low impact, low probability, probably isn't going to get much attention. If it's got a high risk and a high probability, that's definitely going to get a lot of attention. And then after that, you know, it's up to management, you and your stakeholders to sort of figure out um, how you're going to mitigate these risks or if you even are going to. All right. There's software for this, of course. And so you can use software if you want. All right, so now uh, trying to manage for success. So if every system is to provide a solution to a business problem or opportunity. Great, so uh, that, because again, business is the one paying for this. Remember, you are an expense. Um, there are gonna be budget issues, and sometimes they come from an unrealistic estimate of either the budget or the time. If you find that you don't have enough time, then you end up porting more effort into this, you end up actually spending more money on it, even though you spent less time. Uh, maybe you, you are, um, an interesting project I was on got delayed because we figured this particular group would be able to engage on this date. So that was our forecasting. And it turned out that group wasn't ready for us for like four months. And as a result, we had to sit basically for four months. Now we had other things to do, but the project got d delayed by at least four months. Not knowing what's going on and not responding to any kind of signs of problems. That's another thing that's kind of a deal. And you want to basically uh, uh, look at that. Sometimes it's just tempting to put your head in the sand and not monitor, but you're just going to get in trouble. Lean into the discomfort, basically. Uh, and and, and uh, the faster you can find the problem and then try to mitigate it, the better. Okay, schedule delays. Another interesting thing, by the way, is when people will book a project and not take into account vacation days. Right, so you'll book a project, you'll book maybe three months of stuff, and then the developer tells you about well, halfway through, oh, just so you know, I'm off for two weeks. Well, that's gonna affect your project, right? Or, um, or you know, if you live in Minnesota and you gotta deal with snow days and all that kind of stuff, that could affect your project. And it says human resource issues, not every person is the same level of efficiency or proficiency or even desire to live. And this kind of stuff definitely affects uh, affects the project. And it's also, I think, probably the, one of the tougher things to manage. So they go here through the scheduling issues and um, and I'll just let you just, whatever. So the bottom line is that a project manager's gotta be alert, 
competent and resourceful, strong communication skills, which is why there's an overlap with systems analysis. And you got to work with people, probably, unless you're your own project manager, in which case you now are working with the worst person. So, um, and when the problems occur, uh, uh, basically you're critical in this. And by the way, you could be liable. I'm trying to remember what system this was. Uh, was it the driving system? There was a system right here in the Twin Cities where it, uh, it basically just fell apart. Billions of dollars just disappeared of effort. And, uh, and, um, and I think it was the government. The government went off to try and actually sue the project manager, or in this case, the project manager's firm. So it's, 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 uh, it's uh, not for the faint-hearted. Okay, so that's all I got for project management. And the next thing I'll do is I'll talk about uh, the assignment in another uh, video. Thank you.